Excerpt from the play A Stinging Affair, written by Tasmin Jahan. Scene 5. It is early evening. Best friends Jack and Michael meet up at a local restaurant. Michael looks very tired. Jack is smartly dressed. How did it go last night? Did you kiss and make up? Emily was so loving and so understanding of my needs. We made love until the early hours of the morning. That bad, bad, huh? <sighs> she couldn't care less. To make matters worse, I was given the burden of paying 245 pounds for a stupid rug on my credit card. At this rate, we're definitely going to lose the house. I thought you were in the middle of streamlining your finances. Thanks to my wonderfully charming wife, two cards have been maxed out and another is close to the limit. I struggled to make last month's mortgage payment and right now I don't have enough money to renew the home insurance. I could lend you some money if you like. You've already helped me out. So? That means I'll owe you a lot more money than before. I have plenty of, don't worry about it. That's not the point. Do you want to end up homeless? Of course not. Then let me know how much you need. I'm serious. You're my best friend, and I would never abandon you during your hour of need. Thanks, Jack. I, I appreciate it. Just smile. One day it'll be over. If only it was over. So how does this rug fit in with your relationship then? What does it mean? It means showing off to her rich friends is more important than a roof over her head. She's terribly insecure. Did you give her a reason to stay? Excuse me? She probably doesn't want to see you fall to pieces again in front of her. You've got to give her a good reason to stay. Reason to stay? Hello? Our marriage? Our kids? Don't you think that's getting a little boring now? What? You seem to be saying the same thing over and over again. What else am I supposed to do? If you cannot give her a good reason to stay, I suggest you practice total silence. Total silence? Yes. What would total silence achieve? A lot. I don't understand. She doesn't care about you. So you should go about your daily business in total silence. Um, I mean, unless of course you want to talk to the kids, then that's different. Then she'll realize that there's no arguments, there's no comebacks, no attitudes. She'll calm down and she'll end up with a completely different perspective. That doesn't make any sense. Why? Because Emily and I need to talk to each other to sort things out. I'm not going to play games with her. It's not going to work. You haven't tried it, so how would you know? I'm not interested. Well, you could make it more complicated. It's entirely up to you. How? Leave her. I can't do that. Write a note, put it on the dresser, give the kids a big hug and walk out. No way. Just take a moment and think about it. Absolutely out of the question. Seriously? It's a terrible suggestion. You're not leaving for good. You're just leaving for a while. And where will I stay? Your parents' place. Huh. I'm not prepared to move back in with my parents. I would offer you my place, but the risk of Emily showing up for a showdown is too high. I don't need that stress in my house. I can't walk out on my kids. I know that, but your sanity is the most important thing here right now. I know that too. You could always give that other thing a try. Other thing? Call it therapy. Oh, that? No. Why not? I could hook you up with someone tonight. Are you out of your mind? I'm not going to sleep with someone else. I said it's therapy, not a relationship. Whatever. I'm not interested. It's not as bad as you think. It is. Her name is Tara. No. She's a part-time model. No. She has her own place near the coast. No. She's very beautiful and friendly. No, and a thousand times no. It's a great opportunity. Why are you doing this to me? I've told you before. Men like us who suffer a great deal 
need this kind of therapy. Are you deaf? Fine. Do you want me to rearrange for another day? Are you making fun of me now? Not at all. Please never mention this to me again. Trust me. Once you meet her, you change your mind. I don't care. She knows everything about you. She's really interested and eager to meet you. I really don't care. Hey, we're in a public place. You can't raise your voice like that. Then back off. I was just trying to help. So, how's Fiona been lately? Had a hell of a weekend. She thought she was pregnant. I was in shock. After we bought the testing kit and saw a negative reading, I was so relieved. Why didn't you take any precautions? We forgot. It was a very passionate moment. Your luck must be running out. Not if I'm very careful. Marissa will kill you. To Marissa, spontaneity is an alien word. Marissa is lovely. I know that. She's kind, caring, and so polite. That's why I married her. She'll be devastated when she finds out about Fiona. She's not that clever. Don't, underest don't underestimate Marissa. I'm always one step ahead anyway. If only she knew. You promised not to tell her. I promised to keep out of it, yes. Everything happens for a reason. Do you love Marissa at all? Of course I love her. She doesn't deserve this. It's called survival. Once Fiona and I get a more serious stage in our relationship, I'll talk to Marissa. Good luck with that. Life's too short to live in fear. It doesn't mean that you make dumb decisions. Fiona's not a dumb decision. She's my, my savior. Let's order. I'm really hungry. Sure. And Jack? Yes? Even though I disagree with many things you do, thanks for helping me out. I, I'm very grateful for that. Even though you don't think highly of my suggestions, it's my pleasure. Michael smiles. Jack gestures for a waiter. Scene six. It is late night. Jack is visiting a dilapidated country house. He meets up with Marissa's younger sister, Renee. She is in her late twenties. She appears quite pale and tired. She's casually dressed. They are sitting in a sparsely furnished room, just two chairs and a small table. Jack watches Renee closely as she takes her last puff and stubs out her cigarette on the table. What about Edmillin? Dead. Burton Sands? Dead. Henson in Birkenshaw? Delightfully dead. Roberts? Definitely dead. Wow, you've done really well. You mean my crew have done really well? They've done really well without me. You look awful. I couldn't find a mirror anywhere. Why has the house been so neglected? It's only useful for business purposes now. I see. So you brought them here and finished them off? Evidently. Sweetheart, did you miss me at all? I would never miss you. You can be so cruel at times. Now, shall we get back to business? If I end up in jail again, I'm not going to be happy. It was a total nightmare. I constantly had to watch my back. Too many blood-curdling loonies inside. None of them were proper human beings, except for me. This time, I want you to dabble in a bit of romance. That's shamefully different. His name is Michael. His wife hates him, he still loves her. So I want you to take him off her hands. I want you to meet Michael, use your phenomenal charm and politeness and make him see what a wonderful person you really are. Flirt with him, entice him, then ensnare him. 
why does this sound so easy? Oh, it's not going to be easy. He can be quite difficult. He worries a lot, questions too much, and he has stinking morals. I'm not doing it. Don't you want the money? How much are we talking about, Jack? 10,000 pounds. Just 10,000 pounds? I know you. It's only been a week since you've been released. You have bills to pay like everyone else. If you had the opportunity to make 10,000 pounds, why would you refuse it? Any personal attachments here? Oh, haven't lost your spark, have you? I've only been inside for four years. I don't see why that should make a difference. There may be some feelings attached. I appreciate the lump sum, but I'm not going to do it. This is beneath me. Renee, you have no choice but to do it. This house that you're living in is mine. I'm the one who saved you from ruin. I gave you the clothes on your back and I gave you the peace of mind you always wanted. You may have your freedom now, but you are still leashed in my chains. Well, unleash me, Jack. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do my own thing now. You no longer call the shots. Oh, so you're going to get a normal job, are you? Pay the bills and live hand to mouth. How awfully ordinary of you. Other people manage. You're not other people. Why can't I choose? Because you've chosen not to choose. You depend on others, Renee. You depend on me. Stop trying to control me. <laughs> That's rich coming from you. Why are you looking at me like that? Last time I saw you, you weren't a convict. Does that mean you're disgusted by me now? I feel sorry for you. Why didn't you visit me? I was too busy. You don't love me anymore, do you? I never have. You liar. It's true. Just because I was in jail doesn't mean our relationship ended. You must be confused. Your sister means the world to me. You're just using her. She's the mother of my children. How poignant. Kitty, you two haven't spoken for years. I don't care about Marissa. I just care about you. Business always comes first. Just one kiss. Shall I reduce it to 5,000 pounds then? The sex, I'll do it. I don't need the money. What? Why don't you just admit it? Deep down you love me too. I bet you think of me when you wake up, when you eat, when you go to sleep. When you're doing it with her. Whatever happened between us is over. Get that through your thick skull. I don't believe you. I'll give you 24 hours to sort yourself out. I'll return tomorrow with half the money. The rest will be given to you once the job is completed. What do you want me to wear tomorrow? Wear whatever you like. Perhaps I'll wear nothing at all. I'll see myself out. I'll be waiting, sweetheart. You better get some sleep. I will. I'll be thinking I... about you. Michael will be waiting for you. Who the hell is he to you anyway? Just prickly little thorn. All this for a prickly little thorn? Surely there's more to it than that. Sweet dreams, Renee. From tomorrow, you will be Tara. I'll see you in the morning. Jack hurriedly exits. Rene lights up another cigarette. End of excerpt.
The story thus far. Mike and Lee are throwing a dinner party for six friends while a comet is passing close to Earth to bend realities. At this point in the story, the electricity has gone out in the neighborhood. The power in the house is running on a generator and the only house that also has light is two blocks away. The party has realized that this house is a duplicate of theirs and its habitants appear to be clones of themselves. Two of the guests, Hugh and Amir, have visited the clone house and they accidentally took their box, thus making physical contact with the clone reality. In this scene, Mike and two of his guests, married couple Hugh and Beth, are having a conversation away from the rest of the group. Hugh is discussing notes he found in a physics book that belonged to his brother, a professor of quantum physics. Do you guys know what Schrodinger's cat is? It's a thought experiment. There's a cat in the box that has a 50-50 chance of living because a vial of poison is also in the box. A regular physics would say that the cat is either alive or dead. But my brother says that according to quantum physics, both realities exist simultaneously. It's only when you open the box that they collapse into a single event. But he's also mentioned another theory that the two states continue to exist separate and decoherent from each other, each creating a new branch of reality based on the two outcomes. Quantum decoherence ensures that the different outcomes have no interaction with each other. So we're in the box. We're the cat. We're both alive and dead. So there are two separate realities, presumably until the comet passes or decoherence is maintained, and those two separate realities will remain separate once the comet passes. Everybody will be fine. Decoherence keeps us separate. But we've already interacted with ourselves. We took their box. So we're collapsing on ourselves right now. Not if we stay separate from each other. It's already too late. We've already made contact with our other selves. If the two realities are collapsing right now, I'm going to collapse on them. I'm not going to wait for them to collapse on us. Whoa, Mike. Whoa, whoa, I'll whoa. Go, I'll go over there and I'll, I'll just kill him. Half whoa. kidding. I love my fucking life. Let, let's just be smart before we do anything stupid. And let's stick with what we do know. We're not at war with the house down the street. They might literally be the same people as us. You know what? At the other house, the other Mike's saying he's coming to this house to kill us. I'm going to do it first. Okay, if you do it first, you know who you're going to fight? You. You're going to run into you. So who's going to win that? What if? What if I'm the other house? What if I'm drinking? I mean, just think about that for a sec. That's a fucked up Michael. Oh, God. I'm not going to wait for a fucking drunk Mike to come over here and kill me and kill you and kill you. But if they're us, then this could be. Is it a good thing? It sounds as if it could be a way to reach higher consciousness. We've always talked about meeting ourselves and finding ourselves and here we have an opportunity to actually physically find ourselves. Speaking of finding ourselves, where's Lee? Lee is taking a nap. I don't know if she's woozy from the drops or, or what. What drops? Did you give her that weird concoction you bought? She wanted to take them. She felt weird before. What's in that again? Well, it's got echinacea, golden seal, passion flower, and a little ketamine. Beth, I'm sorry if I'm in the wrong here and I'm saying something incredibly inappropriate. Did you put any of that in the food? Are you serious? She asked to take some and I gave her some. That's outrageous, Mike. I had to ask. Remember that time with the spaghetti? When we did the mushrooms years ago, we talked about it and I put it in the spaghetti sauce. But now that was a group decision. I know we agreed back then, but I had to ask because- 
You think that I put drugs in your food? Listen, if someone took enough of your concoction, isn't it true that they would have hallucinations? You would have to have a massive dose. You would have to take the whole bottle. And isn't it true that one of the other effects can be paranoia? Yes, but again, you would have to take all of it. The whole bottle. The whole bottle! Even if all of us took a bottle each, it would never create a mass hallucination. I'm not a criminal. I did not drug your food. I did not drug your food. It would be a nice conclusion right now. Wouldn't this be great if we were hallucinating? Well, it's not the explanation. Fine. I'm going to go get a drink. I have an idea, Beth. Oh, no. You have that look in your eye. I know that look. I'm going to blackmail myself. I'm going to go to the other house and leave a note for the other me. What? You and me, 10 years ago. Mike, no. I'll say if he comes over here, I'm going to tell Hugh we slept together that night. Mike, you can't. What if someone else gets the note? It's my house. I'll open the door. I mean, the other me will open the door. Mike, this is so stupid. It's brilliant. It will work on me. Okay. Okay. Um, so I just found a note on the door. It starts out, Mike, buddy. Oh, fuck me. The stay put or you know who will find out about the Galaxy Club. It's in your handwriting. What is this? It's nothing. The other me must just be drunk and... Then why is Beth's nose bleeding? Oh, God. Interior living room bay. Norman Perkins, male 30, dressed in a dark suit, sits on a couch. His hands lay loose in his lap. He scans the room around him. He nods his head and smiles at someone in front of him. He lowers his head and wipes his eyes. Martin Perkins, male 65, dressed in a dark suit, carrying a plate of food, walks over to the couch and sits down next to Norman. Martin picks up the food on his plate, picks up a brownie, takes a bite. Savoring the small bite, he smiles. He looks over to Norman. Norman still sits with his head lower. Martin takes another bite of the brownie, swallowing the rest of it. He picks around the plate and picks up another brownie. He holds it over to Norman. Norman lifts up his head and turns to Martin. Not as good as your mother's, but it's almost there. Would you like something else? Uh, I could get a plate for you. When was the last time you had something to eat? Your mother wouldn't approve, you know. She loves cooking, only because she loves how much everyone Mom. enjoys her. Huh? Love. It's not loves. Not now. Not anymore. No. It's going to take me a while to get used to it. You're right. Uh, I'm sorry. You're good. It's a lot to deal with. Um, the rain didn't last very long. No, just a summer shower. The kind your mother likes. Like that? Yeah. 
Why would she sit in the rain? <sighs> to feel. To feel what? To feel different from whatever she was feeling. That sounds a, a little... A crazy? <laughs> sure. Did you ever try it? No. Did you? A few times, yeah. I guess you never saw that. Uh, I remember her sitting in chairs in the backyard in the rain. Oh, but I don't recall you out there. A few times, especially during an argument. If ever it was raining and we were in the middle of an argument, out she'd go. Of course, I'd follow her because I wasn't finished proving my point. But no matter how crazy mad we got, the rain cooled everything off. That sounds like you were both a little crazy mad. I suppose everyone goes a little mad sometimes, don't you? Not enough to argue in the rain. Ah, but every argument that ended in the rain ended with a kiss. A kiss? If you ever know anything, know this. There is nothing to compare to kissing someone you love while standing in the rain. The two of you heated up from an argument that no longer matters. You cling to each other and feel the warmth of your body's skin through the soaked clothes. You open your mouth, you take in each other's breath, exchanging the warmth as the rain streams over you. You melt together as one. You need a cigarette? You know I don't smoke. Maybe, uh, maybe you should start. And maybe you should start sitting in the rain. Maybe. Uh, I've been thinking of climbing on the roof of the house and, and screaming. Maybe sitting in the rain would be less dangerous. No matter what you're feeling, the rain will change you. And it will stop you from screaming. Why is that? If you kept screaming, you'd drown. Oh, good to know. I'm going back in. Can I get you anything? Uh, some of Aunt Jean's fried chicken. Coming right up. But if it starts to rain... I'll know where to find you. Martin stands up and leaves. Norman turns toward one window and slowly, carefully wipes his eyes with his hand. Well, we still got quite a few people here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we can start, well, I guess we'll start with Stinging Affair. Any words for Jasmine, Tasman? I'm going to, uh, very well acted. I, I was just surprised by it. Uh, I, I thought the story was about one thing, and obviously... Obviously, his friend is about something else. But friends I mean, like that. Yeah. I mean, none of that came up in the first piece we saw, correct? Or did I miss something? No. No. Okay. Good, good, good. Uh, it, was, I don't know if it was always, it was always set up for that sixth scene. And the only, the only kudos I can give myself is it took a lot of acting to look at Michelle and say, you look awful. <laughs> <laughs> to turn her down. 
That was tough. <laughs> that was good acting. I really enjoyed Michelle's accent. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Thank yes. you. Yes. I take that compliment very, very highly. Thank you. Now, did, did Tasman give you any idea of the direction of the, where the story was going at this point? Does she fill you in? No, she was uh, closed-lipped about that. Okay. okay. All, all I got was the fact that I, I was confused in that he's setting her up, he's setting his friend up for a date with a woman he hasn't even gotten the yes from her. But then realizing, oh, this character is so controlling, he knows she's going to do it. Right. <laughs> in the beginning. And oh, yeah. it, was, it was nice to get to play an a-hole. <laughs> oh, and that, that's always fun. <laughs> and, and, and to be completely different from the uh, from the first scene, too, the character completely mm -hmm. different. Thank you. Yeah. That worked. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I like this much better than the first one because um, I'm never a big fan of scenes that just take that just consist of two people arguing for the whole scene, especially if the argument doesn't go anywhere and they're just rehashing the same points over and over again. But this one, in this one, the story moved, the characters moved. So um, I like this a lot better. I also had an interesting um, exchange with Ta Tasman in rehearsal because I, um, I had the part for just five days um, because the original actress had a uh, um, problem uh, with coming on, on this date. And so um, I saw Renee as a very confident <coughs> character. And um, I, I felt that the power struggle between her and Jack was uh, just kept going back and forth, resting it back and forth throughout the scene. Whereas in, I felt Jack won in the end, of course. Um, but Tasman asked me to um, put in some vulnerability in there um, whereas I, I felt that she was, I thought she was a very strong, hardened woman. Um, but I liked all doing it the last minute. I liked finding a few places to feel hurt. That's what I think she was looking for. Finding the hurt where she really was like, why didn't you visit me? You know, what do you think I am damaged, defective goods to you now? Yeah. So it wasn't just that I could be um, everything rolling off of me and being able to be, you know, whatever, you know, sort of thing. And so um, I, I liked being able to just suddenly find that. And uh, that, was a, that was a cool experience. Because it, it was a chewy part. I liked it. I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah, that was a good part. Anybody else have any words for Tasman? No. Yeah, I think I think um, I think the character um, has been hardened by being. She's a convict now, so she's yeah. you know she's got this hard shell around her. But yet, like all of us, you know, she's yearning for love, and she just she just wants some love. She just wants attention. You know, you can see that that turmoil. Uh, one of my favorite lines, though, of the whole thing was, um, "You've already chosen uh, not to choose." I, I, I might be paraphrasing, but um, yeah, something like that. You've already chosen not to choose, and I love that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And she says, "Stop trying to control me," and and he's still controlling her right after that. He knows yeah. exactly what to say to make her react. To him and I, I love that. I love. I don't know when she wrote this, but she was very perceptive. You know, it's like when I, when I write poems, <laughs> I always tell my readers that my poems are smarter than me because <laughs> I, I look at them later and I'm like, what did I really write that? And how did I know? Or how did I, how did I understand that? It's an elusive process to you me. tap into your intuition. Mm -hmm. I think so. I think so. So, how did you feel about it this time around? Um, I felt much better. Yeah, it was much more. It was much more doable with with just the three char three actors right. and three characters rather than having so many people. Yeah. 
and, and no need for the scenes to change. Right, right. Just one one scene and um, just three people just made it much more manageable. So did you do a lot of editing out of things or changing anything in your... Oh, I changed a lot. First of all, I had to I had to change some of the dialogue to make what was going on more clear. Um, one flaw with the movie is that, I mean, I had to watch it a, a couple of times to figure out what was going on because people talk over one another and some of it, because the whole movie is improvised. Oh, so, it is? yeah. Oh, yes, wow. the entire film is improvised. So, um, yeah. So um, I had to kind of, and sometimes when people are, it's like, when people are improvising, they might not always say things as clearly as they could. And also they talk over one another because they're improvising. It's supposed to be like a very natural conversation and people aren't always polite and don't always wait for the other person to finish. You don't catch everything. Mm -hmm. So um, I had to change some of the dialogue to make it more clear. And I also mixed, I took a couple of scenes and kind of put them together. I took a scene from the middle of the movie and a scene from the end of the movie and put them together. Um, and also I, because I only had three actors, there were, there's a couple of two actor scenes in the movie and there's a couple of scenes with like a whole lot of people, not very many with three. And so I, I ended up comb having some actors in my scene say things that they didn't say in the movie, maybe a different character said. Okay. So I'm ready to hear feedback from the group. It definitely worked. I think it had a nice flow to it uh, this time. It, it was much smoother. Uh, and I, I and I, 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 you know, I know for this group, it's it's difficult to want to do something that has more than say four characters. It's just it's very difficult to get that many actors in one place. And then when you double them up, and if they're in the same scene talking to each other, it makes it even more difficult if you want to double them up that way. I, I it seems to me the only way to double up is if you've got a character that comes in and leaves and then yeah. the comes in and, and is a different person. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think it definitely it definitely flowed much better this time. Mm -hmm. How did the actress feel? Great. I was mm -hmm. I want to take this moment to say I got such excellent feedback and notes from Mary as a director. So thank you. It really helped me a lot. Uh, oh, thank yeah. you. Oh, I'm, I'm so glad. Yeah. Yes. Mary and I were talking in, in the Zoom room and Sandy, I wasn't trying to exclude you from the conversation at all, but Mary gave me a, a note about something that helped. And then I just blurted out, I'm not acting. Everything that is mentioned in this script oh, is yeah. a genuine terror of mine, and Mary started giving me more notes based off of that, mm -hmm. and I said, I know what you're doing, and I'm going to try to get there, but I don't know if I'm going to pull it off, because it's actually, these roles and this script, it is a lot harder than it looks, and hearing yeah. that there's so much improvisation, I'm a little offended. This was a really <laughs> difficult role for me to, I feel like, make convincing, but just please know that every moment that I was reading my lines and going, I, I am terrified of alternate realities. I don't like it. I don't do clones. The comet thing is not great, but it, it, every part of it was ew. So, <laughs> like scary to you, right? Yeah. yeah. It, it's yeah, so it's unnerving. It, I, I, I hate it. I, I don't even have the words written. I'm and that helped. I mean, that I, mean that I, I know it's unpleasant for you, but it helps with the character. Tacky. Yeah. It yeah. helps with the character because you're scared, and so then yeah. you can just use that for the character. Yeah. I'm yeah. trying without looking tacky. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How about for you, Sandy? Pardon? No, I, I, I got excellent direction from Mary, and um, it really stuck. And uh, she yeah. said she was happy with it, uh, that I was going to be a lot more um, for were accusing me of putting drugs in their food and all and so you know I, I the direction was great and I felt happy that I could uh, follow it yeah yeah mm -hmm. so did you guys find it pretty easy to understand what was going on this time it wasn't too confusing 
I, I think if you were here last month, it wasn't confusing at all. I don't know if, is there anyone? No, that was one of the, well, some of the feedback I got was that it was really confusing and hard to follow. Yeah. yeah. Well. But I, I think that was also because of the doubling up of characters. Uh, oh. And, and, and sometimes they didn't leave when they were supposed to. And, and yeah. I, I think I was one of the characters and there were a couple of times I wasn't sure if I was supposed to go out or not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, the couple times I was supposed to leave and didn't. So, you know, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, when you've got that many people it's just, and on Zoom, it's hard. Sure. You know, I, I bit off more than I could chew with that for sure. So, um, yeah. So, but, so you all were pretty much able to, you all pretty much felt you understood what the scene was about and it didn't, you didn't find it confusing? Was there, is there anybody here who saw it but did not see it last month? Oh, Paul. So, okay. so yeah. were you were you able to follow the story this this month? The lead in to it helped a great deal. I certainly yeah. would not have been able to figure it out without the exposition preceding the action. Mm -hmm. okay. um, well, that was as a physics guy myself, <laughs> I find the premise very implausible. So um, yeah, it's implausible. It's I an implausible. It's science fiction. Believe, so, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's science fiction, and yeah, that was one thing I said to comfort Zev. You know, this is all. Yeah. This is this isn't much. This isn't much more realistic than vampires and werewolves. You know, yeah. this this is this really this is science fantasy. You know what I mean? This is nothing really rooted yeah. in anything actually that might happen or. So don't don't worry too much. <laughs> if this could happen. It worked. It was very comforting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thank you. yeah. Well, but, but to me, what's interesting about the movie isn't so much the whole thing with the comet and the and the alternate realities. It's it's the way it's what it's really about is people asking themselves, who am I? And do I really know people I'm closest to? Do I really know these people? Um and um just like, you know, the, a man who's an alcoholic struggling with his identity is, this is me when I'm sober, but this is me when I'm drunk. And when I'm drunk, I'm dangerous. And who's the real me? And in a sense, even without the alternate realities, Mike is two people. You know, um, a lot of us are, you know, more than one person. And so for me, it's more about taking what's something real about the human experience and then making it... Um, I think there was an actor, I think there's a playwright, I think his name was Strindberg or something similar to that, where he would take okay. characters of real people and then he would turn them into vampires and zombies and stuff. But he made that all representative of aspects of people's true selves and of, of, the, of people's real personalities. And that's what this movie was for me. It was basically giving you a chance to analyze difficult things about the human experience, but doing it in a sci-fi fantasy context so it's a little easier you know i always call that kind of thing the spoonful of sugar that makes the medicine go down you know instead of watching something really really heavy you're watching something heavy but that has something fantastical about it that taps into your childhood self kind of or your your enjoyment of something that's outside of normal reality and that balances out more heavy character material so well, that's kind of an interesting point that you bring up about Mike, because Mike actually at one point is thinking about going over and killing the other person. And it's sort of like she knows or he knows that's a part of him. And if that's a right. part of him that exists in him, then it's definitely going to come up in an alternate reality. Yes. Yeah. So not only does now he have to worry about what if I get drunk, and act out. Now he has to worry about what if another version of me gets drunk and acts out. Right. Yeah, and it's kind of a vicious circle. The more he worries about it, the more he knows the other person's worrying about it, then making him more more important for him to take action, which then is going to make it more important than the other one's going to think it's more important for him to take action. It's just going to escalate. Yeah, yeah, except that maybe the other person isn't worrying about it. Maybe the other person's alternate reality is this is who I am. This is what I'm going to do. It's it's Mike's knowing that that part is in him and an alternate right. reality. That may be all that other person is. Right. Yeah. 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 
Cool. Good. Now we can move on to sitting in the rain. And I, I, I'm, I have to apologize for screwing it up a bit. Uh, I was supposed to be off screen. I wasn't, but I think I can. I think I can blank that out when I go. Yeah. And then I, I thought maybe you were supposed to be there. I thought you were another character. <laughs> and they were going to say, you know, hey, Uncle Jack, you know, <laughs> did you go get some wine or? <laughs> and then I was. I didn't know read, when you got up to close the door. That was the last. I was supposed to read the the, the ending, but when I hit when I hit the space bar to become off mute. My script. Oh, yeah. So it's 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 the problem with the uh, unrehearsed Zoom performances. Yeah. Oh, live theater. Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> but I want to thank uh, 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 Paul and Kevin. Uh, did did a great job with the characters. Uh, I wanted to thank you, Stephen, for creating such. <laughs> a memorable portrait of a particular feeling. And I suspect most of us have had something like that, where in the midst of grief, we remember something cherished. Right. And it's a strange dichotomy and it yeah. deserves to be put out in art. Yeah. Yeah. Although I can say that I, I have never had a positive, beautiful experience of pissing in the rain. <laughs> I can honestly say. I have never had that that life experience, so I had to I had to learn about that from you. Try it. <laughs> <laughs> well, first, you have to get to a heated argument. A heated argument in, in, during the rainy season in California. <laughs> Paul, I saw you waving your hand. Are you saying goodbye, or did you want to? Yeah, I'm saying goodbye. I was waving goodbye to Chuck. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. I'm going to have to go to. I'll see you next time, hopefully. Thank you. Okay. Peace, Nandy. Okay. So Bye.